I am so excited to be here in Berlin, <laughs> if all but virtually. I'm really excited to share with you databases in the microservices world. Here's the part where I tell you I am definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. I've been that person chasing the speaker, and <laughs> it's never worked out for me either, which is why you can go to robrich.org right now. Let's go there, robrich.org. We'll click on presentations here at the top. Here's databases in the microservices world. The slides are online right now. Feel free to grab the slides. They are a website. Um, feel free to get ahead. <laughs> Heckled me about the slides I haven't said yet. This will be fun. While we're here on robrich.org, let's click on About Me and learn about some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a Cyril developer advocate of Microsoft MVP and a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver that completed software to the charities. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp. Or if you'd like a Give Camp here in Berlin or wherever you're connecting from, hit me up on email or on Twitter and let's do it. Some of the other things that I've done, I do a lot of Docker and Kubernetes training. And um, I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode. They read my comment on the air. And they sent me a mug. Woohoo! So there's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. So let's dig into databases in the microservices world. We talked about this guy. When we look at databases and microservices, let's first look at the application architecture with microservices. <laughs> Our history, we started with spaghetti, we moved to lasagna, and then we moved to ravioli. <laughs> I like this analogy, where we started with you know copy paste stuff, and we moved to end tier architecture, the ravioli, and now we're moving towards uh, or lasagna rather, and now we're moving towards ravioli, the microservices. Well, why did we like monoliths? Here is a monolith on the left, and the cool part about a monolith is when we deploy it, we deploy all things together. So deployment was hard, and it was kind of nice to be able to pull that off. As we move towards containers and virtualization, then deployment got much easier, so we moved to microservices here on the right. Now, containers and DevOps made that possible, which is amazing. And now we have these microservices calling each other to get at their data. And in particular, a microservice can own its own data source. Perfect. Microservices. A microservice does one small job. It's easy to scale and replace. It's easy to deploy with containers. And the one critical piece about microservices, they own their own data. <laughs> Now, when we build microservices that own their own data, we don't need to check in with other teams to validate that this column is unused if we want to change its purpose or remove it. Instead, when a microservice owns its own data, it, it's free to evolve that data schema and content however it needs to. Yet usually, <laughs> when we're working in this space, we end up with something like this. We've refactored our app into lots of different microservices. This is perfect. But now we have one big monolithic database. Hmm. Now, that isn't ideal. The reason it's not ideal is now it's really easy for this microservice to accidentally reach into this microservices tables. It's just right there. And now we're back to, well, let me go query the team. Let me uh, send out a broadcast email. Anybody using this column? <laughs> yeah. Oops. So why did we get here? Well, when we refactored to microservices, that was easy. We could do that in a very stateless and self-contained way. When we do that with databases, we need some more help. <laughs> the obvious answer of how we got here, the DBA said no. Now the DBA is um, tasked with making our system reliable. And so, well, the DBA wants to push back on any changes that might disrupt that reliability. Meanwhile, developers are focused on developing new features, and so they push back whenever there's stagnation. Really, the two of us are focused on delivering customer value. And when we look at delivering, delivering value to customers, we're on the same team. DBAs focus on stability in the value function, and developers focus on new features in the value function, but we're really focused on delivering value to users. So. Let's set the DBA aside. Why else would we get here? Well, deploying databases is hard. When we get to a scenario like this, we can really easily wipe out the previous applications and start over. 
But if we wipe out the database, customers get <laughs> a little bit concerned. Um, one of the reasons why we didn't get here, a lot of little databases might be difficult to back up and secure. I was on one project where <laughs> the microservices database went down and they said, oh, well, we'll just pull from last night's backup. You backed it up, right? Oops. <laughs> so if we must use a monolithic database, let's see if we can carve it into small pieces. Will you use bounded contexts? Now, a bounded context could be a database schema. It could just be a set of tables. It could be a code convention that keeps these tables separate. As we create a bounded context, we're identifying the small pieces that focus on a particular task. Let's look at two scenarios, the shopping cart and the fulfillment center. In the shopping cart, we need the product catalog, we need all of the images, and we need to be able to create new invoices. In the fulfillment center, we don't need any of the product catalog, save maybe the product ID. We do need to get at the orders to update their status, but that's all. Really what we need to focus on in the fulfillment center is product availability. So we can create a bounded context that doesn't overlap between these two pieces and they can own their own data in spite of the fact that it still may be in one central database. As we get more towards the automation of getting databases um, automatically secured and backed up, if we can get that automation to automatically enroll them in auth authentication procedures and backup and restore policies, now we can get to, and I'll coin the term, micro databases. A micro database is the database owned by a particular microservice. Now, a microservice may have one or more micro databases, or it may have none. Here's a microservice that owns this data source. Here's a microservice that doesn't own any micro databases. Now, this is amazing. Each of these micro databases was probably created with automation, where it automatically enrolled them in backup and authentication mechanisms to ensure that these databases are secure and reliable, in spite of the fact that there are lots of them. Perfect. A micro database. A micro database is the data store owned by a particular microservice. Other services call into this microservice to get at or change the data in this micro database. So what are some challenges that we have with micro databases? Well, how do we do joins? Well, typically when we want to do joins, we're looking into a different bounded context to get additional context. Now, in this case, <laughs> do we need to call the other service? Instead, let's get each microservice to publish events to an event stores, event store. Now these events can be consumed by other microservices and use that to pre-populate the data. When it comes time to do the join, we don't need to join on another microservices data. We already have the data that we need, perhaps even reformatted into the view that we need. Micro databases. Here's another potential concern. Who owns the customer record? Now we can look through various systems does the shopping cart own the customer record? They need to be able to create orders there. Does billing own it? They need to store sensitive data like credit cards. How about human resources? <laughs> human resources is definitely full of secrets. They want their own spot. Or maybe we'll look to how customers get into the system. Usually sales creates customers. But sales has the difference between leads or prospects and customers. A lead might just be the name that they wrote on the back of a napkin, maybe a phone number, maybe an email address. But a customer needs a full shipping address. We need to know their official name. We might need other details about how to be able to ship packages to them. So if sales is creating customers, how do they differentiate between leads and customers? Well, let's look at this a little bit differently. Let's create a new customer microservice that owns the customer table. Now in this customer table, we'll have a primary key and we'll have an account number. And that's all. This microservice then is responsible for making sure those account numbers are unique. When sales wants to create a new customer, they call into the customer microservice and request a new primary key. Now the sales can 
track additional data in the customer's profile, maybe contact information or maybe the lead that they found. Similarly, the shopping cart can create a call into the customer microservice and then keep additional data like shipping addresses or recent purchase history. Billing can also keep the customer's sensitive payment details in their own separate customer profile. Now, each of these other microservices has a customer profile table that has a foreign key off to this customer table, but they don't reference that customer table. That customer table is owned solely by the customer microservice. So we can see how if we have automation in place to be able to authenticate and backup databases, we can get to micro databases, a database owned by a particular microservice. And though there are some challenges in architecture to make sure that micro databases don't overlap or um, uh, overlap, then we can create these micro databases to build into this system. Now, the cool part about micro databases is now they don't all need to be the same type. Typically in the monolithic database, we all, we all defaulted to the same type because, well, we had only one. When we have lots of different ones, provided we have that automation to be able to authenticate and back up the data stores, we can get to lots of different types of databases. <laughs> this quote by me <laughs> right now, they don't all have to be the same type. We can instead optimize for the type of data source that we need we can optimize for the type of data that we want to store. So let's take a look at all of the different database types. Some of these might be new. Some of these might be <laughs> old friends. We could look at SQL, NoSQL. NoSQL is kind of an interesting one because, well, everything that isn't relational is kind of NoSQL. But we'll dig into document databases, graph databases, key value databases. You can look through the list here. Some of them might be new to you, like event sourcing, column stores, or even new SQL databases. Let's dig in. As we look at each one, we'll take a look at the characteristics with each data source, the pros and cons, best use cases, and some example databases. I'm definitely not here to sell a database, but <laughs> if you'd like to get past the blank page, perhaps you can use some of these vendors as search terms to get you to the next stage. Let's take a look first at the first one, SQL database. Now with a SQL database, we can think of this like an Excel table. What's interesting that makes it different from an Excel table is that every row is the same width. We have uh, the same number of columns in each row. And that represents one piece of data. And then we have columns. Each column is the same data type. So perhaps we're storing the state or an age. And all of those then will have that same data type. Part of SQL is the SQL query language that allows us to select data from a particular table where conditions exist. It's really cool. One of the things that makes SQL really interesting is ACID compliance. Let's double click into that. As we look at ACID compliance, we have atomic, consistent, isolated, durable, and thus the ACID acronym. We have a mechanism where the entire query will either succeed or fail together. Now, the really cool part about ACID compliance is we know the moment our transaction finishes, it will be in the database. It will either completely succeed or fail. By comparison, we can look at eventual consistency. As we look at eventual consistency, we might look at online shopping or purchasing airline tickets. Now, when we make the purchase, they'll probably send us a thing that says, you're getting close. <laughs> Maybe it hasn't charged my credit card yet. Maybe it hasn't shipped yet. Eventual consistency is interesting. If I walk up to, for example, my favorite coffee store, I'll swipe my credit card and pay for the coffee. If I were to go check my account balance right now, I bet the charge didn't even show up yet, or maybe it's just pending. By the time my credit card statement comes, yes, it will be consistent and the coffee will show up. This eventual consistency is interesting. And by comparison to Atomic, is a very different approach. SQL focuses on that atomic mechanism, the ACID compliance. And so relational databases are ACID compliant. The SQL query engine has been optimized for decades to ensure a very speedy execution engine. So for SQL 
databases, for relational databases, we have this really tuned SQL engine. We have ACID compliance. We have a strong schema, and we have table joins. On the downside, <laughs> we end up optimizing for a storage space, <laughs> third normal form, to remove data duplication and to store data more compactly. It's generally not designed to scale horizontally. These SQL databases were built before multiple processors were really a thing. So oftentimes, we need to keep buying a bigger box. Well, what happens if there is no bigger box? Hmm. SQL databases generally store data in relational tables, and that's different than objects in our code base. So we'll probably need an ORM mapper. So here's some examples of SQL databases. SQL is a good default database. So if your monolith, so probably your monolithic database is a relational database. Let's look next at document databases. <laughs> now, there are other types of NoSQL databases, so we'll call it document databases. What's interesting about a document database is it stores usually JSON data. Now, it might store it in binary form, but these JSON objects can nest properties. We can put arrays inside them. We can nest other documents inside these documents. And we end up then with a collection rather than a table. Now, Document databases are built for reads. So it might be great for, for example, a news site, where I go grab the entire article together with the title and the author name and the article, maybe references to images, maybe the first page of comments. All of that gets pulled in one read so that I can display it on the page. Now, because I've denormalized it in this way, I do need to optimize for uh, migrating the data, I may need to write to multiple places if I wanted to, for example, change that author name. On the upside, we have no schema. On the downside, our application does assume a schema, so our application needs to compensate if our records don't match that schema. How do I query if I want a where condition on the lack of property? <laughs> because of concerns like this, we can't use the standard SQL syntax, though many document databases will kind of build a SQL-like experience. But how do we call into nested objects? How do we do a where query on things that don't exist? On the upside, we don't have to do database migrations. On the downside, our application may, be a, may need to be a whole lot more robust to compensate for a lack of strong schema. We'll probably also end up with different SDKs and query languages per database and per programming environment to be able to handle this different data store. And the big one, <laughs> there are no joins in document databases. Some document databases have kind of hacked joins into place. But because there's no consistency across the schema, then it's not really a thing. Here's some examples of document databases. Document databases are good when you need to focus on reads, when you need to read exactly once to get all of the data. For example, a news site, or a CMS, or a product catalog. Next up, let's look at graph databases. Graph databases are great for focusing not only on the data, but also the relationships between the data. So we have nodes and relationships, and this really elegant syntax for querying that is able to navigate those relationships. How is this different from foreign keys? It's that query syntax. I could definitely create an intermediate table and do some joins to create this graph, but it's that query syntax to be able to traverse the relationships that is so key. On the upside, we're focusing on this relationship. On the downside, <laughs> probably at the expense of everything else. So cross-table joins are kind of painful in graph databases. Here's some examples of graph databases. They're great for when we want to emphasize those relationships, messaging apps, social networks, recommendation engines. Next up, a key value database. Now, the beauty of a key value database is that we can read and write by ID very quickly. It's pretty much a table with one ID column and one big blob column. Now, the cool part is that blob doesn't need to be the same between records. So maybe one record is configuration data, one is a connection string, one is cache data associated with a customer shopping cart. We just have those things, a key and a value. On the upside, querying by ID is really easy. On the downside, Querying by anything else is probably really difficult. The only way to do a where clause on anything but the primary key 
is to loop through all keys, deserialize the data in another location, and go check through that other data store. So here's some examples of key value data stores. It's great for cache, for configuration, for user session data, where I need really speedy access and I'm only gonna read by ID. Next up, time series databases. Now the beauty of a time series database is that we can create time buckets. Now here we're looking at, um, here we're looking at this content and we can create this time series thing. Now, unlike st uh, standard relational experiences, when we create these time buckets, these cells may have multiple values or may have no values. So we can do things like min and max and average across the data that matches that time window. Time series databases are great when we focus on timed events, but we're also trading time for other things. So it's probably not great for other things. Here's some examples of some time series databases. It's great for high ingestion of time-focused data. Maybe we have clicks on a website or tracking events from mobile devices or sensors. Next up, let's look at text search databases. Text search databases focus on querying text. Can I find documents that match this phrase? Or can I find what pages this phrase is in? We create an inverted index, much like the index at the back of a book, where we've listed all of the words that we want to highlight, and we can go straight to the page number for that word. These are great when we want to find the text at a particular page, or we want to find which documents match. But we can't really focus on other things, like non-text data and stop words. In English, a, an, the, these are all words that usually don't have meaning. But as we look at other languages and other cultures, we may find that these words are important, or we may find different stop words that are important to ignore. We choose to ignore these stop words so that our index in this particular term doesn't get overly huge. But eh, that's very culturally and language specific. Next up, uh, so here's some examples of text search databases. They're great when we want to find and categorize uh, text documents. But if we want to filter on anything else, other metadata, we'll probably need to store that in a different database. Maybe we have a relational or a document database that is able to filter down the list of documents that we query to match a particular metadata thing, like region or language. Next up, object stores or blob stores. Amazon S3 is a great example here. Now, we can pretend that this is a file system, <laughs> and we often do by creating the key with slashes in it, but it's kind of fake. It's you know a key value store, kind of, but it has a big binary blob. Object stores are great for doing things like big video files, log files, database backups. Similar to key value stores, though, I can't really search by anything other than the ID. If I wanted to search by, say, what time was the, which uh, backup has the last version of this file, I need to open each file, <laughs> untar it, and look through it. I can't really query by non-ID values. Here's some examples of object stores. It's great for storing big data where I need to have a lot of content, but I only need to query it by ID. If I need other metadata, I need to store that in a different database. And then that might filter the search space that I'll use in my object stores. Next, event sourcing. We saw how publishing events from one service to another allows us to specifically move to micro databases. Now in this event store, we have a mechanism where we can write these objects asynchronously and then consume them whenever we're ready. Now older objects may fall off as those expire, but the reads can happen at different places from different consumers. These event store databases are great for doing asynchronous communication between services, where one service can write as fast as it can and the other service can consume when it's ready, maybe when it comes back online. I can start to filter these by channels or topics or just filter it to the messages that I care about. It's great for doing intra-process communication in an asynchronous way where we can assume that hardware failure may happen. On the downside, <laughs> we need to assume that our event store database is always available. 
Here's some examples of event store databases. It's great for transmitting data between services, uh, for compensating for hardware failure, um, or reprocessing data to meet changing business needs. Next up, column stores. Now, what's interesting about a column store is, unlike relational stores here on the left, column stores focus on keeping data in columns. Now, if I have a column that is, for example, the states in the United States or the countries in the world, I know I have a very small subset of values, so I can compress this data in a really elegant way. Column stores are great for bulk reading and bulk writing. They're not great for uh, seeking and transactional updates. So if I'm doing analytics, column store may be perfect. Here's some examples of some column store databases. They're great for doing OLAP analytical processing, but not great for OLTP transactional processing. New SQL databases. Now here's one you may not have heard about. With SQL databases, we usually scale only vertically. We need a bigger and bigger box. With new SQL databases, it's still that SQL format, but we can scale horizontally. In this case, we've partitioned our data across many leaf nodes, and we have the data stored in this partition. So we may have aggregator nodes that accept the query and pass that on to the leaves that need to enroll in this query. The leaves will query the data and pass that back to the aggregator to create a deterministic result. We can think of this as SQL with an SLA. On the upside, we can now scale horizontally. We can throw commodity hardware at it. Do you get that spinner and <laughs> your data store isn't coming into play? That's where a new SQL database can do great. On the downside, because we're potentially passing data across the network for joins or for queries, there might be some additional latency. Now, we can generally compensate for this by putting all of the nodes in our cluster within one really high latency, uh, high throughput network. Here's some example of new SQL databases. New SQL databases are great if you need to keep that ACID compliance, but you need to scale horizontally instead of vertically. When we look at databases, we often end up looking at hybrid databases. I'm a SQL database, but I also have time series data. Or I'm a document database, but I also have a SQL interface. As we get closer to databases, a lot of databases want to move into this hybrid space so that they can satisfy many needs. This is that spot. Grab your screenshot or take a picture with your phone. Here's a list of all of the different database types of brief description and what they're best used for. If you're looking for a database, it's good to default to a SQL database because you have that ACID compliance and strong schema. If you find a great match in a different database format, then that's probably a great fit for this problem and you can experiment with it. If you have this and that, then you might look to a hybrid database that can do some of this and some of that. Let's keep ACID compliance with SQL, but let's also do time series or let's create a JSON column so we can have additional document database-like properties. Now, the, way, the reason that we got here was because we moved from a monolithic architecture to micro databases. Now, we did this with automation. We were in, enabled to enroll our databases in automatic authentication and backup services and provisioning these data stores. If we don't have that automation, we may need to use a bounded context to be able to pretend that we have separate databases. Maybe we separated it into different schemas or maybe we just have to be really careful not to step on each other's data source. When we get to that level of automation, move towards micro databases, where the databases don't all need to be the same type. Here's that list of databases that we take a look, took a look at, and yeah, there's quite a few. When you get to micro databases, they don't all have to be the same kind. They can be the perfect type for your solution. My recommendations? Use database as a service whenever you can, because you'll get them to care for uptime and reliability and point in time restore. Choose a SQL database by default, because you have that strong um, ACID compliance and you have that strong schema. And choose others if it is a perfect match, if you can find that exact scenario that you need. This has been fun showing, sharing databases in the microservices world with you. For those of you watching later, grab me on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich. For those, uh, the slides are already online right now at robrich.org. 
And for those of you who are here live at the event in Berlin, what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What data stores do you prefer? Which ones did I miss?